to someone around you, just wish them a happy Easter this morning. Amen. Well, again, we're so happy to have you here this Easter Sunday, just being able to worship with you this morning that our King is risen. For those of you who don't know me, maybe you're new around here, my name is Brian, and I get to serve here as the worship pastor at Oak Hills. 
And whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're just so thrilled that you chose to spend this morning just worshiping our King with us. And today is an extra special Sunday because it is Easter Sunday. We, we just celebrate together that our King is risen, a resurrected Jesus. And I know this is a super celebratory time for everyone. We gather with family, we go on Easter egg hunts, we set all these things up, but I don't want us to miss the significance of this day. This isn't just an event that is a kind of a mystery of history that we don't really know how to explain it at the time. It wasn't just an impactful moment for a couple of disciples of Jesus or a couple of his friends. Instead, this is the single most significant event in all of human history. It's the moment where mankind as a whole is redeemed and made right before God. We have the chance to be restored to the Father through what happened on this day. And that is why we truly celebrate. Because through the blood of Jesus, broken and sinful people like you and me can be made right before God. And that truly is something worth celebrating today. And that's something our heart as a church is just that we live in light of this truth, that we can be restored, we can come to God and we want to point people to a vibrant life, a life of hope, a life of purpose, and that can only be found in Jesus. So that's our heart as a church to strive for that, point people to Jesus, because he's the only hope that we can find. And we're about to head back into a time of worship, and I want to read this passage from 1 Peter, starting in verse 18. And we're just going to sing in one moment about the blood of Christ. And just thanking him for the blood, because it's by his blood that we can be renewed, we can be washed Again. So it says this, starting in verse 18, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope or in God. And today we celebrate that, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. But along with that, when he rose, he conquered sin and death and makes a way for us to be restored to the Father. So let's stand again and let's continue worshiping him and thanking him for the blood today.
pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for sending your Son, Lord, making a way for us to be restored unto you, Lord. I thank you for paying the price for our sin, Lord. We were broken and hopeless, but you provided a way. I pray that you be with us, Lord. Allow us not to miss the significance of what you've done for us. Allow each moment of our lives to reflect just who you are, Lord. Allow us to pursue you with all that we have, to worship you with all that we are, to be a living sacrifice in the day today, to glorify you with every breath that we take. Thank you for all that you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Oak Hills Church. Easter Sunday, the 11 a.m. service. I am shocked that our early service was the bigger service, which means you guys much ha must have Easter plans for lunch after 2 p.m. Uh, and so you, you got plenty of time. Uh, but uh, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm so thankful that each and every one of you are here. We had a, a great first service. And man, I'm just looking forward to spending some time with you uh, this morning. Uh, today is Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I know uh, he just had you sit down, but I'm going to be an annoying pastor and have you stand up as I read the account of the resurrection, just in honor and in reverence of the story that changed the course of human history. This is from Luke chapter 24. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but, they, but, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. Amen. That is the most important story in human history, right? It is a story that, that changes things for all of us. It gives hope to every single person. It is the foundation of our entire belief system. But if that one event didn't happen, the entire Christian faith crumbles. It all hinges upon that one thing as the lights go crazy, all right? <laughs> but it all hinges on this. And it's a picture how, how each one of us have hope. Everybody say hope this morning. Hope. You have hope. I want to remind you at the get-go of our Easter sermon, right as we get started, that no matter where you're at in life, no matter where you're at emotionally, mentally, spiritually, no matter where you are, you have reason for hope. Some of us come in here today, and man, if we're going to be honest, we are limping in here spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. We're exhausted, we're tired, we're frustrated, we're angry, we're full of grief, we're full of sorrow, we're full of sin, and we're struggling. We're basically here because it's Easter Sunday and we're supposed to be here. And then there's the other side, right? Some of us here, by God's grace, like, like we're living out some, some healthy rhythms, some healthy disciplines, and man, like we're in a season where we're on fire for God. I want to tell you, wherever you fall in this, on this giant spectrum, I want you to know you have hope. There is hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. To show you how this hope applies to all of us, all over this spectrum, I want to draw your attention to Luke chapter 15. Get your Bibles out or your version notes out. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to talk about a story that Jesus tells. An incredible story. He was a good storyteller, and they're called parables. And so we're going to read one of them here in just a second. We're going to read a story about two brothers. Two brothers that are complete opposites, all right? Raise your hand if you are the opposite of your sibling, like in every way, the complete opposite, right? Okay, so these two brothers were completely opposite, okay? Like the younger brother, rebellious, all right? Like kind of wants to do his own thing. Some of you are like nudging the person next to you, right? Like he's kind of a free spirit, doesn't want to live in the confines of, of the home that his dad has established, and then there's the older brother, right? The older brother, this guy, he's the type of son you want, right? He's, the, the, he's loyal, he's obedient, he does his chores. He'd probably make a great employee, right? Like, like somebody that, that we can all recognize, oh, solid dude right here, right? And there's a tendency when we're thinking where we are on the spectrum, do we lead towards the younger or towards the older? There's a tendency to think, well, 
I mean, there's obviously a right answer, right? Obedient and loyal is clearly what we're supposed to be. But today, as we dive into this story, we're going to see something. That both of these brothers are in need of something. And consequently, we're going to find that no matter where we find ourselves on this spectrum, we're in need of something. There's something that we need that only God can provide. And maybe we come in here today and we're not even aware that we need it. To really dive into this scripture, we're going to look at this individual story. All right, so let's talk about the younger brother. Everybody say younger brother. Let's talk about the younger brother. His, wor- his, his life can be described in four specific words, right? Four specific words. One is reckless, all right? He is reckless, all right? He is destructive. Another word, destructive. Then we're going to find that he's forgiven, or excuse me, he's repentant and then forgiven, all right? This is kind of the path of his life, okay? So let's kind of go through this, and we're going to see if, okay, we kind of lean towards this, okay? So he is first reckless, Right, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Here's the story. Jesus continued, there was a man with two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. The younger brother was tired of the restrictions, Right? The younger brother probably heard of the life that his friends were getting to live, and he's like, oh, I mean, that looks so much fun, right? He's scrolling his social media news feed like, oh, I mean, that's the kind of life I need to live right there, right? And so he, he figures out a plan, get dad to, to give him half of uh, his inheritance, half of the father's land now. And so all of a sudden, the dude is loaded, all right? He's got all the money that we could ever want. He has everything that he wants, and so now life is limitless, complete freedom. The guy can do whatever he wants to do. He has the resources to do it. And so he goes and he lives an incredibly wild life, okay? So this would be, kind of putting it in our context, this would be the stereotypical like rebellious teenager, right? Just doing whatever we want because, hey, why not, right? This would be the the college student that's starting to, to, to kind of wonder about sex, drugs, and alcohol, right, trying to to live and figure out how they want to live. Like, this would be the adult that is consumed in immorality, consumed in addiction. This would be the adult that is, like, esteeming idols of society, wealth, fame, power, glory, like, all these things, and bowing down to them. This would be the individual living a wild life and loving every minute of it, just living it up. But listen, this behavior is reckless. It's reckless, and reckless behavior has consequences. Just yesterday, uh, we were uh, in Stillwater with my sister. We were celebrating Easter with her family and my family and my parents and all that sort of stuff. And, and uh, Isaac, my four-year-old, he has just had cochlear implant surgery on his right ear. All right, just had this. And uh, he has like strict conditions right now. He gets it uh, activated on Friday. Uh, but right now, he has two main things that he's not supposed to do. Don't jump on the trampoline and don't go swimming. Don't submerge it in water, okay? So in his mind, everything else is a free-for-all. He can do whatever he wants, right? And so yesterday, perfect example of how reckless uh, behavior can can have a consequence. Um, He's running in the woods. The kid is running all out, all right? He's, He's four years old, which means his feet don't get off the ground really high. And so he's running as fast as he can. He trips over a stick or something, and he comes this close to hitting his head on a jagged stump, right? Instead, he hits it right here, and you can see a little mark, right? And, and as a parent, you're like, oh, I mean, that was almost a very significant moment in our life right there. That was almost a really big deal, right? But what we see is, is reckless behavior, doing what we want, living it up, right? Hey, it's our life. We can, we can do whatever we want. It has a consequence. And we see this play out with the second part of his life that's described by being destructive, See, godless behavior can bring a smile and a shot of adrenaline in the moment. Feels great in the moment, that's why we do it, right? But it's chipping away at our soul. And maybe if you're here today, if you're going to be honest for a moment, you know that, that this has played out in your own life. You've seen the consequences of your own reckless behavior. If you just look in the rear view mirror, right, you can see the relationships that are struggling because ah, I didn't handle this how I'm supposed to handle this. 
Maybe you can look in the rearview mirror and see a potential that we never lived up to. You can see pain, regret, and remorse. You can experience a loneliness that never seems to go away, an exhaustion that is never quenched. And, and while in public, okay, in public, you would declare that you're okay with the decisions you've made in life. Like, hey, I've made decisions. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to live with the decisions that I've made. I wonder if in moments of solitude, you question if somewhere along the way you got off the track. Somewhere along the way, you've started making decisions that are godless, reckless, and they've proven themselves destructive. This is the younger brother, okay? Luke 15, let's keep going in the story. Verse 14, after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out, a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. This is what we call rock bottom. I don't know if you've been there. This is a good illustration of rock bottom. He's lost everything. See, the advertisements for wild living don't ever show us the consequences of wild living. They just show us the highlights. They just show us how, how oh, glorious, and this is amazing, this is awesome. It never shows us the, the domino effect of godless decisions. And, and what is he starving for? This is really important. He's starving, starving for the, the pods of the pigs, right? This is a showcase of something. It's a showcase that when we are in a life of sin, it progresses. Has your sin ever progressed? It, it, it gets bigger, and it gets bigger. And, and what we find ourselves is, is when we're living a life apart from God, we begin to, to get to a point where we are craving things that we once thought were disgusting. At one point, this was disgusting, but, but now it's gotten bigger to where we've justified it, we love it, we, we acknowledge it's not that big of a deal. And so we find ourselves craving pig's food, craving pig's pods right here. He's starving, alone, and longing for God. And you and I, were, were starving for just one more shot of instant gratification. One more shot of instant gratification that we know causes long-term regret, but oh, we just keep going back. We keep going back and we keep going back. Just one more outburst of anger. It's not that big of a deal. Just one more visit to that one website. No one knows. Just one more time where we're exalting money as the most important thing of our life. It's a pretty normal thing to do. Like this isn't a big deal. And why in the moment it feels right, it's ultimately pig's food. It's never bringing us the joy, the hope, the meaning, the purpose that we can find in Christ. But something happens to this younger brother, all right, that's living reckless and living destructive. Something happens, all right? He comes to the third part of his story, repentant. Verse 17 says this, when he came to his senses, how many of my father's uh, hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. There was a moment of clarity in this individual, right? I love what Jesus says. He says, he came to his senses. That's what you tell your kids, like smack them on the back of the head. Come to your senses, boy. All right, this, this, is the, this is the illustration right here. He came to his senses. A realization that his life didn't have to be lived in the filth of the pigs. His life didn't have to be hopeless. It didn't have to be just like, ugh. Sometimes I have conversations with people in our church where, where life is just, we're just living it. You know, just kind of treading water. How are you doing today? Uh, because we're just, we're just kind of getting by. We're in the pit of life and there seems to be no escape. And, and here this, this man comes to his senses. I don't have to live like this. There is another way to live. There is a way out of this. And so he devises a plan, a really good plan it seems. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home and I'm going to go back to the father. I'm going to go back to dad and, and I'm going I'm to apologize. I'm sorry. I've been an idiot, right? And I'm going to work for him because this makes sense, right? He took half his land and so it makes sense that he's going to work for that land, right? And he's going he's to toil in the ground to try to make up for all the things that he has done. Like that's a noble plan. When we wrong somebody, it makes sense that we want to try to fix it, Right? But what we find in this repentant son that had come to his senses 
is when he's greeted by his father, the reaction is not at all what he anticipated. We see a picture of the fourth part of his story. He is forgiven. Everybody say forgiven. forgiven. He's forgiven. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 24 says this. But while he was still speaking a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. To the younger brother's surprise, his dad came running to him, overwhelmed, overjoyed that his son was back. But notice how his father didn't react. His father didn't bring up all the the stupid things that the younger son had done. He's not bringing up all the disgusting actions that he's done. He's not bringing up the, the shame that he has brought the family. He's not bringing up how, surprise, surprise, you didn't live up to your potential. Like He's not bringing any of this up. Instead, He's celebrating. He's not ready to condemn. He's not ready to force retribution and make his son work. He's just ready to celebrate and forgive, to celebrate that his son has come back to him, come to his senses and returned to the father. He was dead, but he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. And forgiveness from the father was absolute. That's the younger brother, okay? Reckless, destructive. Repentant, forgiven. Then the older brother. His story is very different. It's much shorter in the account. There's not as much there. Uh, but his story would be showcased in, in two, two words. Let's say obedient, but self righteous. Obedient, but self righteous. Very different than the younger brother. All right? This is what it says in verse 25. We're going to read the rest of the account, so I want you to follow along. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, is, he was with him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you, f- you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, the brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. See, the older brother was in the field doing what he was supposed to do. He was doing all the right things. I mean, he was living the life. While the younger brother was causing the dad to stay up late in worry, the older brother's like carrying out his chores and living the life he's supposed to live. And so this moment comes and all of a sudden, younger brother is being celebrated. And I don't know about you, but, but I'm wired a little bit like the older brother in this. And it's like, well, this isn't fair. Like, I've, I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. I've been doing all the right things. And, and, and little brother comes back from squandering half of our inheritance. And we're just supposed to act like this didn't happen. We're supposed to act like this isn't a big deal. Instead, we're supposed to make it a really big deal that he's back. Like, this doesn't make sense. But in this frustration of the story that many of you have heard dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of times, what we see is that the older brother is leaning towards a level of self-righteousness. He's, he's forgetting that he's not as good as he thinks he is. Or he's, he's leaning on this reality that, that maybe he's overestimating his own righteousness and instead snarling at the younger brother who's an idiot, just frustrated and angry. And so I want to ask you, where do we lean? Do you lean towards the reckless? Do you lean towards the older? To really understand this, We have to understand who the audience is in this very famous parable. The audience is crucial. Context is crucial to Scripture, right? And so we go all the way back, go back in your Bible, chapter 15, verse 1, all right? Just go up to verse 1, and you're going to see the context. This is who he's talking to. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
See, while your Bible may call this the parable of the prodigal son, and that's probably what you know it as, it may call it the parable of the lost son, Jesus never calls it this. He says, there was a man who had two sons. Better name is this, this is the parable of two sons. And both of these are crucial to understanding why he's talking. There is one son, right? The tax collectors and the prostitutes. They're living, they're living reckless. They're living godless. They're doing whatever they want, and they probably don't care a whole lot. But there is another part of this story. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, those resting on their religion, those resting on, on having good behavior, doing the right things, their checklist is strong, right? Doing all the right things. They're reading the Bible. They're, they're listening to Christian music. They're not cussing a whole lot. Like, like these guys are good, good human beings, right? Yet Jesus is speaking to both of these. Now, it's safe to say in this Easter gathering, in the 930 Easter gathering, and in every Easter gathering in this city, state, and country, and world, it's easy to find people that drift in both of these directions. Right, it's not hard and, uh, to find people that are living void of Jesus, apart from him. They're wondering, they're, they're lost, and they're struggling. And it's not hard to find people who are resting on all their good deeds, all the good things that we've done. It's not hard to find both of these. What we have to understand, church, is that both of these individuals... The younger brother who's, who's rebellious and free-spirited, the older brother who's obedient and loyal, both of these brothers are dependent upon the love of the father in this story. They're hopeless without the father, completely hopeless. Understand, no matter where you are in the spectrum, both groups are hopeless without the blood of Jesus Christ covering their sin. Both groups are hopeless without the tomb being empty, giving us hope and a future and an eternity uh, with him. Both of these groups are utterly hopeless. And so we come today wondering where we are in this. And maybe you are, you're like, I don't want to admit it publicly, but maybe I'm the younger brother. Right now, you're, you're living it up. You're doing what you want. Our relationship with God really isn't any realm of how we're living our life. We're, we're maybe here out of obligation. But maybe in the moments of solitude, we're beginning to see something. That our recklessness, our godlessness is starting to have consequences. It's starting to be destructive in our most valuable relationships, in our marriages, in our relationship with our kids. It's starting to have an impact, starting to have an effect or maybe in, in our own life, we're starting to, to sense this, this longing for something and we're, we're in a heavy spot, struggling in life because our sin has consequences. If that's you and you find yourself leaning towards the younger brother, like I'm, I'm living a little rebellious right now, don't miss the beauty of this story. There's a beautiful thing. The brother comes to his senses repents of his wrongs and experiences the overwhelming, unrelenting love of the Father. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Church, on this Easter, a new life is there for the taking. If you're spiritually dead, you can be alive. If you are lost, you can be found. Hope is one decision away. Love is one decision away. Purpose, meaning, and value is one decision away. So I have an action step for you. If you're finding yourself living a little rebellious, struggling with sin, right? Maybe we find ourselves like, like just now we're realizing, yeah, maybe I'm not living the way God desires me to live. I have an action step for you. Come home. Everybody say, come home. come home. Come home. Run back to the Father because he loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross to cover your sin, all your junk, all the things that you've done. Be empowered by the reality that Jesus Christ has risen from the grave to where you and I can have eternity. Like death loses its sting when you come home. Funerals are a celebration when you come home. Because death has lost its power and its grip over us. So if you're reckless right now and you're, you're rebellious, come home. Today is the day to do that. If you're the other, 
and you're really resting on your religion and your good behaviors and your good church attendance and you came to Easter, maybe some of you, I'm looking around, some of you sat in both services, like, wow, that should earn you some extra prizes, right? <laughs> That's impressive. But understand, maybe we lean this way. Maybe we repent of our sins because we have sin. Listen, no one here would doubt that you're a good person. You're a solid individual, but our actions don't allow us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Your good actions outweighing your bad actions and you being a good person because you're a good person, it doesn't mean anything into the entering into the kingdom of heaven. We're dependent on one thing, the grace of God. That's it, the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, very famous passage. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Listen, you may be in here and you don't really view your life as reckless and destructive, but, but maybe your life leaned towards self-righteous. I don't really need to change. Oh, I would beg to differ. All of us need to address things. And I wonder, we see ourselves like, ah, oh, I'm not really like causing destruction. Well, self-righteousness, especially within the church, a self-righteous posture can most certainly cause destruction within the body of Christ. These are important things. So, so which one do we lean towards? Are we, are we rebellious or are we obedient and loyal? Which one do we see? If you're, if you're rebellious, come home. That's your action step. If you're, if you're struggling and, and maybe you're a little self-righteous, I have an action step for you. Praise Jesus. Pretty simple, right? But praising him allows us to humble ourselves. We are hopeless without him. Remind yourself of that today. You're hopeless without Jesus. Hopeless without the blood of Jesus Christ. If we don't have a relationship with him, we are utterly hopeless. So those that are resting on religion, may we praise him. May we exalt his name. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross paying the penalty that is due us. And then on the third day, he rose from the grave, allowing you and I to have victory over death to where we can live eternally with him. And so today, as you kind of contemplate which one you're struggling with, may we remember that no matter where we are in the spectrum, we are hopeless if that tomb is not empty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we love you and we praise you. And God, we, we find ourselves somewhere on this spectrum, openly rebellious, reckless, and destructive, or maybe on the high horse a little bit and, and a little more self-righteous. God, I pray that you, you open our eyes to the areas that we need to address. Father, we come on this Easter Sunday and we just thank you for who you are. We're a sinful group of people that struggle, but we want to praise you with everything that, you, that we have. And God, I pray that in this moment that the kingdom of heaven would invade the kingdom of earth. And that we wouldn't wait till later in life to address things, but we would sense the Holy Spirit in our life trying to get our attention. Come to your senses today. Today is the day. And we come to know him. God, I pray that you bring heaven to earth in this place today. Father, I pray that you meet our needs because on this Easter, we have a lot. We have a lot of struggles. We have a lot of heartache. We have a lot of overwhelm. Oh, God, that we just give us the daily bread that we need to make it through another day. Father, I pray that you forgive us of our sin. We are a sinful people. May we cling to you and, and cling to the cross. May the blood of Jesus Christ cover our sin. I pray that for each individual here that you would lead us from temptation this week. Deliver us from evil. We are bombarded every day. Every time we open up our phones, every time we arrive to work, arrive to school, temptation is everywhere. God, help us. We long to cling to you, but we easily wander from you. On this Easter Sunday, second service, I wonder where you're at. I wonder which brother you relate to a little more. 
in a moment of authenticity, in a moment of transparency. I'm not going to point you out, but it's just a way for you to acknowledge, publicly acknowledge to God kind of where you're at. If you're leaning towards rebellious, leaning towards kind of doing whatever you want, maybe if we're going to be honest, it's a little destructive and it's a little reckless how we're living life that the Holy Spirit is prompting you that this is the areas to address. I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna single you out at all. I see hands all over the place. God, help us as we are reckless. God, help us when we wander from you. God, help us when we, we struggle to, to live obedient lives and we wanna put ourselves first and live the life that, that everybody else is living. God, may we come to our senses today and run to you. I wonder today if there's those in the room that in a moment of transparency, in a moment of authenticity, we lean the other way. We lean, lean towards resting on our religion, resting on our behavior. Because we do a lot of right things, and so we're a pretty good person. If we lean towards relating to the older brother a little bit, I want you to raise your hand, just a moment of, of authenticity. I see hands. Oh God, we come today, no matter where we're at on this spectrum, hands raised in both situations, we come recognizing we are hopeless without you. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you that he rose three days later, conquering death and giving us hope. We praise you, Father. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. At the end of, of service, or really towards this, this final song, if you want to come and for prayer, just grab me. We'd love to, to pray with you. Let's all stand together as we worship with all that we have, our last few moments of Easter Sunday. Let's, uh, let's praise Jesus like never before.
to God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching all praise, King Jesus, to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my
such a joy to be able to worship with you today, our risen Savior. As you're taking a seat, turn your attentions towards the screen. We are so glad you had a chance to join us today for Easter Sunday, and uh, next week, we're very excited, as you see, we have a brand new sermon series kicking off, and next week's a big week because it is Celebration Sunday. Somebody say Celebration. Celebration Sunday. We're going to celebrate what God is doing right here at Oak Hills Church. Obviously, we're now at two services, but we're not celebrating, hey, we have more people showing up to church. What we're celebrating is are the lives that have been transformed, the souls that have been saved because of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is moving here, and we're blessed in a lot of ways. If you're, if you're new at Oak Hills Church, you haven't been around in a while, there's a dream campaign going on. There's pictures right there in the lobby you can check out on your way out. We have some capital improvements we're making over the next year or two and some big things going on at, across the entire church. And so one thing that's coming up on Monday, that's tomorrow, you're going to get an email. If you don't receive emails, there's a QR code in the seat back. You can grab a Connect card, fill out your email information. But there is a brand new Vibrant Life podcast. It just started. We have our very own podcast here at Oak Hill Church. It just started. It's live right now. You'll get a link to that email, to that podcast tomorrow. We encourage you to check that out for weekly episodes with the Vibrant Lives. It's another way you can stay plugged in. Before you leave today, make sure you get a chance to take a picture at the photo wall. But again, Next week, we're celebrating Celebration Sunday. We have food trucks and a bounce house. So if you plan on coming to 11 o'clock service, I encourage you to come in a little early. Get a chance to hang out with the rest of your church family as we have bounce houses, food trucks. It's just a great time to celebrate what God has done and what he continues to do through the people in the church body here. We're so very grateful for you to be here and for you to join us again next week for Celebration Sunday. At this time, we're going to pray and we're going to bless the offering. That's one way we give. One way we worship here is through our gifts, through giving our tithes and offerings. There's three ways you can give here at Oak Hill Church. You can drop a cash or check in the black boxes on your way out the sanctuary doors today. You can send a text to 84321, or you can go on ohdmn.com and set up recurring gifting if you'd like to do that. But please join me as we pray and bless today's offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for such a powerful message today from Pastor Matt. It's just a great reminder and a challenge. No matter where we're at on the spectrum, Father, we're dependent upon you. Thank you. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you as we celebrate the resurrection, Father, our Lord and Savior. We ask that you be with us, be with this entire church family, those that are here today, those that are watching online, Father, as we continue to point more people towards Jesus. Be with us. Have the Holy Spirit move through this place, this place Father. Give us wisdom. Give us courage to take the next step, to be plugged in, to be in the vine, Father. We thank you so much. Bless today's offerings. And everything we do here, we do it in the name of Jesus and to further your kingdom. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen, amen. As you stand up, we're going to dismiss like this. As you stand up, don't forget there's a photo wall, some donuts. I'm going to say striving to be. And with everything in you, you're going to say a vibrant voice of Christ. Striving to be. Have a great week.